If you've ever been to a wedding or have been married yourself, you know there are a lot of rituals the bride and groom must go through before the party can begin. From bridal parties and bridal showers to diamond rings and flower bouquets, these traditions have become almost as important as the wedding vows themselves. But where did all these customs come from? Today, we're talking about the surprising origins of wedding traditions that are still practiced today. But before we take the plunge, why not subscribe to the Weird History Channel? And let us know in the comments below what other odd customs you would like to hear about. Okay, I now pronounce you Weird History. These days, any day is a nice day for a white wedding. Just ask Billy Idol. But before 1841, the preferred wedding dress was bright, colorful, and reusable in everyday life. A bride would only use a white dress if her family was wealthy enough due to the high cost of cleaning such a garment. Seriously, have you ever worn a big white dress? It picks up stains from other rooms. But Queen Victoria reset that trend at the age of 20, when she wore an all-white gown to her wedding to Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. Rather than signifying purity, as the tradition goes today, the white was chosen as the best color to highlight the delicate lace of the wedding gown. With this new white-dressed tradition, Victoria also stipulated that only the bride and her bridesmaids would be allowed to wear white, a tradition still in practice even today. Perhaps the most important part of any bride-to-be's planning is getting that perfect dress. But choosing a beautiful and memorable gown wasn't just about showing off to your friends and family on your special day. Back in medieval Europe, a wedding gown was something all the guests wanted a piece of, literally. Wedding dresses of the time were single-use and built for action, because the bride would be left in tatters after running away from the women attending the ceremony as they ripped her dress to shreds. It sounds pretty violent, not to mention more than a little rude, but it was actually a type of fertility ritual. The shreds of dress ripped from the bride were considered good luck charms that would help with conception. Throwing the bouquet was a way to distract frenzied guests long enough to escape with your dress unscathed. It wasn't until dresses became more expensive and intricate that the tradition started to fade. But the practice can still be observed at weddings where there is sufficient beef between the bride and certain guests. Speaking of the bouquet, most brides you see walk down the aisle will be holding a dazzling bouquet of flowers. Back in the Middle Ages, brides still carried a bouquet, but it was usually in the form of strong-smelling herbs and spices, like a solid barbecue rub. While not as aesthetically pleasing as flowers, the blend was said to ward off ill health, bad luck, and even evil spirits. Somewhat less advertised was how herbs like dill and basil were able to mask the stinky smell of body odor. Hey, it gets hot under those big dresses. These same spices were then consumed by the bride and groom during the reception as a way to increase sexual desire. Because nothing gets you in the mood like eating an entire spice rack. Once again, the Victorian era turned this tradition on its side. Instead of carrying the classic 11 herbs and spices, early social influencer Queen Victoria popularized carrying a tiny clutch of flowers surrounded by moss and orange blossoms. That queen, what a trendsetter. Being a bride-to-be in ancient Rome or feudal China was a dangerous ordeal. Aside from dealing with drunk aunts and uncles, ancient brides would have to be particularly careful about being kidnapped, although those dangers aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Brides at the time would often be required to travel long distances to her groom's town. This made her an easy target for robbery, assault, or even rival suitors attempting to sway the bride-to-be, presumably by holding up a boombox playing Peter Gabriel. To increase the likelihood that the bride actually made it to her wedding, an entourage of identically dressed bridesmaids would be employed to travel along to the wedding and confuse any would-be attackers. Sort of like the Thomas Crown Affair. Eventually, this practice became law. A Roman wedding was required to have ten witnesses attend the ceremony, all dressed in matching colors. Otherwise, the wedding would be considered invalid, not to mention gauche. Beyond the legal requirements, the similarly dressed witnesses were believed to ward off and confuse evil spirits, who may wish harm upon the new couple. Weddings are not just about celebrating a loving bond between two people. 
For many, they are considered a business transaction. In places where marriages are predominantly of the arranged variety, the father of the bride often plays a major role. It was believed centuries ago that the father's presence was necessary for the whole thing to run smoothly. Nowadays, we leave that to the DJ. Wedding historian Susan Wagoner believes the custom of a father walking his daughter down the aisle stems from the days of arranged marriages. It seems the groom-to-be was less likely to back out when the looming presence of his future father-in-law was heading toward him. So it may have been less about giving his daughter away and more about rooting the groom in place with a face full of scowl. Inclement weather, tipsy in-laws, and a rambling best man speech are just some of the problems modern couples face today when planning a wedding. I guess they were prostitutes, but I don't remember paying. Okay, how about that? <laughs> but Victorian-era weddings had somewhat different concerns in the form of bad luck curses. Something old, something new, and a sixpence in your shoe is a traditional wedding rhyme believed to have originated in Lancashire, England, and is meant as a blessing of fertility for the bride. The first documented reference of the rhyme is from an 1871 issue of St. James Magazine. Brides who were worried about evil spirits descending upon them could also follow along with the rhyme in order to have good fortune in their new life. For instance, something blue was typically a garter, which protected against an infertility curse passed through by a malevolent glare. Something borrowed, on the other hand, was usually an undergarment from a woman who already gave birth. This would trick the evil spirits into thinking the bride was already fertile. Aha! Joke's on you, ghosts. While the sixpence in your shoe line has been absent in modern times, it was meant to bestow economic prosperity on the new couple. Maybe we should think about bringing that one back. The first bridal shower was believed to have been thrown in Holland around the 16th century and began as a way to skirt the dowry system. There are several reasons why families would want an alternative to the dowry system. Mainly, the cost involved would be too expensive, or the father of the bride would be strongly opposed to the match, like the dad in the Polly Shore classic son-in-law. A bridal shower provided an attractive alternative. Friends and family would get together and give small favors and gifts to a bride to aid her in married life. Once America got hold of this custom in the Victorian era, high society took the concept and made it their own. Ladies would hold showers to celebrate the marriage, exchange gifts, gossip, and presumably mimosas. So why is it called a shower? Well, the ladies in attendance would place small gifts into a parasol. The umbrella would then be opened, effectively showering the bride with gifts. These days, with gifts like stand mixers and full bedding sets, it's hard to find a way to shower the bride without knocking her unconscious. The true origin of the wedding veil is often debated, but experts mostly believe that the practice can be traced back to ancient Rome. Historians mostly agree that the bride wore a veil as she walked down the aisle as a kind of shield from the evil spirits, who are bent on stealing her happiness. Once the ceremony was completed and the spirits were defeated, the groom could lift the veil. Man, who keeps inviting all the spirits? Maybe they confuse the open bar inventory for the guest list. Another, perhaps more shallow interpretation of the veil's purpose was to mask the bride's face in an arranged marriage, so the groom wouldn't know what she looked like until the union was sealed, sort of like marrying a scratch ticket or a jack-in-the-box. This goes hand in hand with another tradition that the bride and groom not see each other prior to the ceremony. The two would spend the night before the wedding alone, both to avoid bad luck and to keep the groom from bolting after laying eyes on his mystery bride. We've already discussed how some people see weddings as a business transaction. This was certainly the case in ancient Rome, where engagement rings were a way to ensure Roman women were obedient to their grooms. The Gemological Institute of America states that engagement rings were used to signify a business contract and to affirm mutual love and obedience. So while it was still a symbol of the bride and groom's union, it also functioned as a brand or bill of sale. Ah, romance. These rings could be made from ivory, flint, bone, copper, or iron. Brides-to-be would often be presented with two, an iron ring worn at home and a gold ring to wear in public. Diamond engagement rings did not become the go-to engagement ring until 1947, when Dutch-British company De Beers launched an incredibly successful advertising campaign for the diamonds they mined in South America. 
The bachelor party has been around for centuries and usually follows the same beats. The groom's best friends throw him a massive shindig during which all manner of debauchery takes place and no part of it is ever discussed afterward. This infamous pre-marriage tradition was men only for a long time, all the way up to the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Previously, brides-to-be were only typically thrown a bridal shower, where they were given gifts that would help them in their upcoming role as a wife, such as small appliances, vacuum cleaners, and a list of their soon-to-be husband's favorite beers. But as women in the 60s became more sexually liberated, the bridal shower was traded in for a rowdy and rambunctious bachelorette party. So awesome. By the 1980s and 90s, bachelorette parties had become the official premarital tradition for new brides. Although bridal showers are also still thrown, because who doesn't like free gifts? Just please don't try to stuff a KitchenAid mixer into a parasol. Carrying the bride over the threshold is a fun tradition for bodybuilding grooms, or grooms who enjoy having a fun story to tell in the emergency room on their wedding night. According to the encyclopedia Marriage Customs of the World, the custom dates back thousands of years to ancient Rome. Experts believe the ritual began when Roman soldiers would carry off women to be married against their will. Yikes! Whether that's true or not, the practice evolved into a kind of game that would be played during Roman weddings. The bride would run off to her mother, while the groom and his friends would stop her and pull her away. The game would start when the groom's posse carried the bride into the house and we assume she would then run out after she saw all the band posters he'd already hung on the walls. So what do you think? Which tradition's origin surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.